Retake is brought to you by the Apple TV Plus drama series Severance, named AFI Best TV Program of the Year. Nominated for two Critics' Choice Awards, the Emmy-winning show is directed by Ben Stiller and stars Adam Scott. Awards eligible. More at fyc.appletvplus.com. I'm Helga Davis, and I'd love for you to join me in conversation on my podcast, Helga. I'm speaking with artists, scholars, and cultural changemakers about the path we're all on. Listen wherever you get podcasts. LAS Studios. Hi, everyone. This is Retake. I'm your host, John Horn. Happy New Year to you and yours. On this week's episode, new reports about Hollywood's hiring practices show few gains for women. Plus, my two top movies of 2022, one a narrative film and one a documentary that I'd recommend you seek out. You'll hear my conversation with veteran Harry Turner, the subject of the incredibly moving documentary, Wildcat. I was this lost soul and I went to the jungle and these kittens kind of like made me strong again. But first, my interview with writer-director Sarah Pauly. Her new movie, Women Talking, is a work of fiction, but I believe it holds many truths, especially in its powerful depiction of how women are marginalized and what it really means to be a male ally. Women Talking is also a beautiful film to watch. Writer-director Sarah Pauly's new film is adapted from the Miriam Tays novel of the same name, which was inspired by real events. Like the novel, Pauly's film is focused on a group of devout women of varying ages in a present-day religious community. They and their children have been repeatedly sexually assaulted by the men who run the community, and over the course of several conversations, the women must decide... Do nothing. Stay and fight. Leave. Leave. It is not a simple decision. Their abusers have told the women they are responsible for the assault, and the women furthermore believe that if they leave the community, they won't get into heaven. Complicating their decision is that the women have no agency. They aren't allowed to be educated, and they don't even have access to maps. Polly's credits include Away From Her, Take This Waltz, and Stories We Tell. The cast of Women Talking includes Rooney Mara, Jesse Buckley, Claire Foy, Judith Ivey, Frances McDormand, and Ben Wishaw. I spoke with Sarah Polly at the Telluride Film Festival, where Women Talking premiered and where Polly received a Career Achievement Award. You'll also hear us discuss her collection of essays, Run Towards the Danger. It includes a recounting of her experiences as a child actor, some of which were traumatic. The story at the center of this film is an act of rebellion. Do you think the movie itself, and maybe the stories you are drawn to and want to tell, are acts of rebellion in their own way? I mean, I certainly think this book is an act of rebellion, and I tried to be very true to the spirit of this book. And yeah, but it's it's rebellious in all kinds of un, like not obvious ways as well. Like it's obviously rebellious in the sense of taking on the patriarchy and talking about building a new world. But I found it also rebellious in the sense that the women also have to look inward and within themselves and how they've absorbed patriarchal attitudes and how that has impact how they've impacted each other and also what it means to be a perpetrator what it means to be guilty in a society that is based on inequality and power structures um not just patriarchy and so like looking at you know how boys are raised yes and also the harm that does to men as well that are locked in, you know, locked into these horrible sort of gender roles and expectations um, that it isn't actually serving anyone except the people at the very, very top of the economic ladder and race ladder and gender ladder to have these power structures in place. And so, so I do feel like um, what I love about it is how it takes on our assumptions about even if the men, you know, get pointed out and they're guilty and go to jail have we solved the problem? 
because there will always be others to take their place in a society that's based on inequality. So I just loved the sort of like the rebelliousness of the book that wasn't as obvious and that I wasn't hearing that that conversation a lot. Like there were amazing conversations that came out of Me Too and it changed so much, I think. And hopefully, I mean, at least within the film industry, has it changed so much? No, let's let's just look at, let's just yeah. look at reality. But I think the, the beginning of those conversations was hugely important. What I was excited about with Miriam's book is it took it into the more complex, into the more nuanced, and into the bigger problems of social in- inequality. You last directed a movie how many years ago? I directed a movie 10, 11 years ago. Okay. Yeah. And, and you have been giving birth to children and raising children. And at the same time, you also wrote a book called Run Towards the Danger, mm-hmm. great title, um, that recounts some of your past experiences, for better and for worse, making movies. And I'm wondering, both that time away and reflecting back on what you have done and what you've learned through the creative process and that you wrote about in this book, did it change the way you saw your work going forward? Yeah. I mean, I think that it was amazing to have that period of reflection and to be able to kind of process, you know, I grew up on film sets, some of which weren't safe and were not happy experiences. And I think that kind of infected a little bit my feelings about having a career as an actor or even as a director. Like, and any time I got sort of close to any kind of success, I'd have a sort of allergic reaction, feeling pushed, even though no one was pushing me as an adult. People were just supporting me. But you do bring a certain amount of mapping on your old experiences onto your new ones. And I think um, there was a real process for me over the last few years of untangling, you know, what's my, that kid experiencing versus what's the adult actually experiencing. What the adult is actually experiencing is this amazing gift of being able to tell stories with incredible collaborators. And so I can kind of hear that voice now of anxiety and like, I don't want to be here and go, that actually doesn't belong here anymore. And so I think I've sort of come back into filmmaking with this, enormous appreciation of like what I get to do and the excitement of it and the gift of it. And I think it just took me a long time to get there to know how lucky I was. And, and with good reason, I mean, I felt like my life was at risk as a kid on sets and it was not a happy place to grow up, but it's a very happy place now. And I have agency. I want to ask you about allyship because this is a movie that, that I watch as a man and feel great shame about how men behave. Um, And it's not specific to, Anybody I know, but it's specific to men generally. I mean, there are a lot of bad men who have done a lot of bad things. And there's a character in this story named August, who's played in the film by Ben Wishaw, who feels to me like a very good example of an ally in terms of letting these women tell their story and record it, write it down. How would you define like what allyship looks like and is Ben's character in a way an iteration of allyship? For me, it always was. Like, that was the word I used from the beginning when I, you know, was re- adapting that character and reading it in the book is he's sort of a model of what an ally should look like, I think. And I think a lot of that is holding space, finding out how you can be useful, um, listening. And I think it's really, really hard. I think it's really, really hard how to know how to do it well. So I do think that it was very important to me that there be a male character in this film that was very, very good. And actually the only one we get to know and really see their face is very, very good. And I think the film at large for me is less about what we want to destroy and more about what we want to build. And I think that the the conversations about what we want to tear down are really important, but we have to make more important what are our imaginings of what our future could look like? What could it look like if boys weren't raised with these toxic, rigid ideas of what it means to be a man? What does a really great ally look like? What does a world that treats people of all genders, men, women, and, and all genders, well? Um, it's certainly not this one. I mean, I, I certainly don't think like capitalist patriarchy is working for most men either. Um, so I just feel like the breaking down of all of those things is important for everybody. And it was really important to me to show what's possible. Like Ona says that 
to August at one point. It's really good that you're here to, to remind us of what's possible because it's easy to forget. It is easy to forget. I mean, it's very easy to forget as a woman every day. It's very easy to forget that there are good men out there. And there are also really great people of all genders raising really great boys right now. But they're just, they're not as loud and there needs to be a lot more of them. And, uh, but yeah, I just, what I love about August is his ability to listen and also to make himself practically useful without thinking he knows what the solution is and taking his lead. Useful and almost invisible. I mean, he, yeah. while you're talking about that, I'm thinking like studio executives need to behave like August, that they have a skill which is the ability to help somebody tell a story. And what August does is he gets out of the way uh -huh. as much as he can and lets mm. these women tell their yeah. story without him interfering. And I think that's, that's also a model for yeah. the creative process, that yeah. if you are really going to bring about equality and, and representation in Hollywood, it's about enabling the underrepresented people the women in this story are incredibly underrepresented in terms of how they're treated in this religious community. And August lets them have a voice. Mm -hmm. And that's, to me, one of the great takeaways of this film. Yes, it's a story about very strong women making a very difficult decision, but it's also about somebody helping them tell their story and have their debate and guide it so that they can come to the decision that they want to make mm -hmm. and not get in the way. Yeah. And it's funny when you were talking, I was remembering that my my thing, my mantra that I said to myself every single morning before going to set was make it easy, get out of the way, help where you can. And I just said that to myself constantly because it was like, how do you create the space for all of these people who are going to have to draw on some very traumatic moments in their own life or even just trying to access these really, really difficult places? How do you create a, a space that's conducive to creativity and also doesn't hurt people. Um, and August certainly does that. He, he, he makes it easy, gets out of the way, but when he is asked to contribute, he does. Um, and it's not like he's not, yes. Does he feel shame? Yes. Does he feel embarrassment? Yes. But it's not paralyzing because I think the shame we can get into around this can be paralyzing. And then, then we're making, people who have been marginalized and this certainly goes for race i think like we can make people feel like they have to make us feel better constantly or like then they have to deal with all of our big feelings of shame and it's like yes it's appropriate to feel really awful about <laughs> how men have behaved how white people have behaved absolutely but you need to like get your boots on the ground too and get moving. And if like, if that's paralyzing you, making you useless, so you're just sitting around talking about your shame all the time, not helping anybody, I'm not sure what that does. So I think it's a uh, finding that line between the reality of what history has been and accountability and figuring out how we help move those conversations forward and, and be of service and of use to the people who have actually suffered the most. Women Talking opened in limited theatrical release on December 23rd. It expands into wider release on January 20th. Coming up, the documentary Wildcat. Retake is brought to you by Apple TV Plus, presenting the drama series Severance, crowned the best series of the year by the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Variety, The Guardian, Vanity Fair, and more. Nominated for two Critics' Choice Awards and honored by AFI as one of the top 10 best television programs of the year. The Emmy-winning drama series is directed by Ben Stiller and stars Adam Scott, Patricia Arquette, John Turturro, and Christopher Walken. Awards eligible. More at fyc.appletvplus.com. L.A. Made is a new series from L.A. Studios about bold innovators and how they changed our world. I'm M.G. Lord, host of the first season blood, sweat, and rockets. The rocket industry was booming in Southern California in the late 1930s. Women have always been making essential contributions to aerospace. But it left out a lot of people. Subscribe to LA Made on Apple Podcasts, NPR One, or wherever you get your podcasts.
Now to another film that I also first saw at the Telluride Film Festival this year, and another of my favorites of the year. Directed by Melissa Lesh and Trevor Beck Frost, the documentary Wildcat focuses on Harry Turner, a young British soldier who served in Afghanistan and is struggling with depression and PTSD. As part of his recovery, he travels to the jungles of Peru, where he ends up working with baby ocelots who have been orphaned by loggers. And all the while, with cameras rolling, we witness Turner's ongoing struggles with mental health. I spoke with Turner when he was just starting to hear people's reactions to the film in Telluride. It has been quite a, an eye-opening experience. People coming up to me and telling me about either their child who has suffered with depression or either a friend who has committed suicide. Um, and then when they talk about the film and they say, you know, this could be very impactful to people who are struggling. I, I didn't start this documentary because I wanted to make a documentary about mental health. I was filming through the passion and love that I have for a wild cat that came into my care. And so therefore, the the footage of me in the hammock and me chilling out with him and bottle feeding him and you know teaching him how to hunt and doing all these things it was just because I really really loved it it was it wasn't for the fact that I thought this was going to be shown to millions of people let alone the fact that I was going to be crying on screen let alone my the fact that my family were going to be involved and and so for me personally the people coming up to me and telling me you know stories about how beautiful they thought it was and how open I was and how uh, honest the film was um, it, it's been it's been beautiful but also quite emotional at the same time because one in four people struggle with depression 22 veterans in the US commit suicide per day and so when you think about these these numbers and then you have these people coming up to you it makes you feel like I started off this project with just a camera and a cat and now I'm potentially changing people's lives. There are different ways in which this movie is made. There is the footage that you shoot yourself um, with a camera as you're with the ocelots or when you're in the jungle. There are the filmmakers who come in and film. And then there are fixed cameras, kind of like a reality television show. And one of the fixed cameras captures a very, very private moment. And I'm wondering if there was a conversation that you ever had about consent, because at a certain point, the cameras kind of disappear and you might forget that they're there, and about things that you felt were too private that you didn't want shown. What was the level of trust between you and the filmmakers, and were there certain things where you said, I can't share that with the world? Between myself and the filmmakers, there was a lot of, um, I would say, respect. And with that respect, it was knowing boundaries. And I did have conversations with them and it was, uh, it was, it was kind of to the, to the point. It was, if I'm not feeling like a camera being on me, I'm going to tell you to please put the camera down. And they did. There were a lot of moments. And to be honest, the moment that you're talking about in the film, I had no idea the camera was rolling. But I gave my permission for the filmmakers to film what they wanted. And even though that moment is very hard for me to watch, uh, it's very uh, it's very difficult and, and obviously takes me back uh, to a point in my life which I wouldn't necessarily regret, but I kind of wish I'd have dealt with things a little bit more differently. Um, it, it definitely kind of pushes me to think that I... I gave my trust to the filmmakers and I think that they respected that greatly and I couldn't really have asked for a better um a better outcome because with with being in the jungle you are very intimate um you know we're living on a very small platform we share the same stream we you know we do everything together cook for each other and and when it's that time to just not be on film we we weren't I said this the other day, and you may think it's a pile of rubbish, but when I was explaining the film to other people, I said, it's a story about a soldier who is suffering from PTSD and other mental health problems who goes to the jungle to kind of get away from a lot of things. And while he's there, he starts caring for these baby ocelots, who are basically these little kittens. 
And part of your job is to teach these adorable little kittens how to become hunters and killers. At the same time, you're teaching them that you are going from being a hunter and killer to trying to find out your interior kitten, I guess, this innocent thing. That was my read. Do you think there's validity to that, that that these lines kind of intersect in that way? I think that everybody's going to go into the film and they're going to come out with something, whether it be positive or negative, um, whether it be um, something they can relate to, whether it be an interest or, or a passion that they, you know, have have been sparked by. And so I feel like going into this film, you should have an open mind. You know, for me personally, I agree with what you're saying. I think that, you know, I, I was this lost soul and I went to the jungle and these kittens kind of like made me strong again. And I was trying to make them strong. Nature is, is one of the best healers for me personally. And I feel that with nature, you can, um, you can get on with what you need to do. You know, you can, you can overcome boundaries and you can do great things as long as you kind of put yourself within nature and surrounded by things which are natural. Being surrounded by a, a concrete jungle is not healthy or natural. Um, and, and it's one of the main reasons why what I'm doing right now with trying to raise money so that I can buy land in Ecuador so that then I can not just protect and conserve and also potentially do some work with uh, other animals, but to also take people who are veterans or who are people who are struggling with mental health to the jungle so that they can feel how I felt back in, you know, 2014. And they can they can be in nature and they can be like, wow, I feel alive again. Because I think that what this film can bring to the world is that men can open up about their depression, men can open up about their mental health, and women and, and anybody who wants to open up about it, they can. And they can find strength in nature because nature is the best healer there is on this planet. Harry, great to see you. Good luck. Thank you. Wildcat is in select theaters and currently streaming on Amazon Prime. Coming up, two new studies reveal a disappointing lack of progress in Hollywood when it comes to hiring women and people of color. I'm Emily Guerin. In the next season of Imperfect Paradise, the podcast series from LA Studios, the wellness industry, a bastion of health, spirituality, and QAnon? Feels like the cosmos conspired to put me here to learn from this woman. He's actually kind of like Kundalini royalty. Imperfect Paradise, yoga's queen of conspiracy theories, a new podcast exploring radicalization in the wellness world. Listen to episode one wherever you get your podcasts. Finally, here's my weekly entertainment news chat with KPCC Morning Edition host Suzanne Watley. I started off talking about two new studies which showed, shockingly, that women behind the camera are still few and far between in Hollywood. Well, this is something, Suzanne, you won't hear me say very often, if ever again in the history of time as we know it. But let me quote Taylor Swift. I think I've seen this film before, and I didn't like the ending. That is her song, <laughs> Exile, with Bon Iver singing along with Swift. And yes, we have seen this film before for all of Hollywood's promises to do better and hire people who look like the country and not the country club. It's still very much a white man's world. So what are the numbers? Uh, well, first, there is the USC Annenberg Inclusion Initiatives. Inclusion in the director's chair report it found that just 9% of the top 100 grossing films released last year were made by women. And that's nearly 30% down from the previous year. Only three women of color directed one of those highest grossing releases, despite the fact they constitute more than 20% of the country's population. Some studios did better than most. The USC report found Sony Pictures Entertainment hired five female directors for its top films last year. And when the time frame changes the top 100 films over the last 16 years, 
Paramount Pictures fared the worst with just three women behind the camera among its 170 releases. Let me say that again. Three women directors out of 170 movies in the real world that gets you in misogyny jail. <laughs> In Hollywood, it's just the way things are. And in addition to the USC report, the San Diego State Center for the Study of Women in TV and Film released its annual celluloid ceiling study, and it looks at many jobs behind the camera. The findings are equally grim. 93% of the top 250 films last year had no female cinematographers. 91% lacked a female composer. 75% didn't have a female editor. And 70% had no women as writers. And there were no material shortages term gains in any of those jobs. Something interesting my husband has pointed out since he is an editor that that actually started as a woman dominated field because it was negative cutting in film. And eventually, it, uh, I guess a lot of the women have been sort of shut out of the action now. Just a bit. Gone. <laughs> Just a bit. Um, are there any solutions to this uh, virtual exclusion of women from uh, these roles in Hollywood? Well, it Yes. And one of the things that was interesting is that the San Diego study demonstrated that movies that are directed by women tend to have more women as department heads. So when a woman directs a film, the percentage of female writers is four times greater than when a man directs and the percentage of female cinematographers is five times higher. So you can start by hiring women directors because they will hire women department heads. So you got to hire the women directors first, and that means you, Paramount Pictures. All right, Paramount Pictures wearing the cone of shame this morning. Thank you, John, and have a great weekend. Uh, You as well. Thanks for listening to Retake. Happy New Year. We'll see you again next week. I'm John Horn. Retake is produced and engineered by Michael Cosentino and Monica Bushman. The editor is Suzanne Levy. And a special thanks to the entire KPCC LAS Newsroom. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. Have you ever seen a performance or encountered an idea that's made you feel like you've stepped through a portal to a new and fascinating country? I'm Helga Davis, and for the fifth season of my podcast, Helga, I'd love for you to join me in conversation with the extraordinary people that make those performances and have those ideas, like poet Claudia Rankin, choreographer Bill T. Jones, and playwright Michael R. Jackson. Listen to Helga wherever you get podcasts.